We're down. We're ready. We're live. It's episode 10. It's episode 10. Double digits. We did it. We've done it. Thank you, everybody. Stickers for everyone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So today we're going to talk about (laughs) the knits that we actually wear, right? And the ones we reach for again and again. Mm -hmm. And I think we're going to be talking a lot about imperfection. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And growth, I think. Yeah. 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 Well, did you bring a stack of knits? <laughs> yes, I did. And I just folded them while we were just talking right before we hit record. Uh, because I was embarrassed that they weren't folded. But some of them are not folded because they just like live on top of my dresser from being worn. Yeah, mine mm-hmm. live in my chair drobe. Your what? Yeah, you know, when you have like a chair in your room that you can't sit in because it's full of your clothes, your chair drum. <laughs> Got it. Check. It's just a mountain of textiles. Uh, uh-huh. You know, you've worn I it want... once, but you don't really need to launder it, but you don't really want to put it back. I told Candace that we needed a chair for the bedroom and she was like, for what? And I was like a little betrayed. <laughs> don't show her this episode. It's for a chair drum. <laughs> exactly. What do you mean? You don't know what for? Because <laughs> it's cheaper than a treadmill to hang your clothes on. <laughs> yeah, look, listen, the treadmill's all the way over at the gym, at the complex gym. Yeah. Doesn't make sense to me there. was there. <laughs> Very real talk. <laughs> I have never bought... Um, a treadmill but i did once buy a peloton that became a very fancy clothes hanger i have never purchased an a piece of gym equipment my stat baby gave me um pink sandbag free weights that she saw at target because she knows i like to walk and they do level my power walks up so thank you thank you to my baby um but I'm a yoga teacher, so I have invested lots of money into knowing how to do yoga by myself, which I guess is like the equivalent of an internal treadmill that I hang my baggage on. (laughs) (laughs) So, check. (laughs) Check. Uh, Yeah. So, what were your, before we get into it, should we do something? We should do our tea. What's your tea? Yeah. Uh, it's fermented. It's the booch. I'm having kombucha today. Oh, nice. I wish I poured myself some kombucha. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I like this but... one. I don't like them all, but I like this one. What flavor? Trilogy. Okay. It's one of the the one. TTs. The one. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's going on in your brains? Oh, God. So I'm like just mm-hmm. coming off this two weeks of massive back pain flare. So Mm -hmm. I have been cleaning up my house (laughs) and recovering and cooking actual food for my family instead of living on takeout and going to physical therapy and, you know, triumphing that I made it to the top of the stairs without resting. So yeah, that's, that's really all I've got. Um, I have been knitting on my, one of my fall releases. So I have a sleeve. It's so pretty. is really exciting um because this is the third time i've cast on this project and third time's a charm y'all it's gonna happen how about you yeah um well my tea is water right now and i was also gonna talk about work-life balance today because we're always on the same page i have reinstituted (laughs) my early afternoon constitutionals which is when i walk around the neighborhood with headphones on but I like to call it a constitutional because as I've said a million times inside of my heart, I am a 1000 year old woman from the Victorian era, just trying to break free of these corsets y'all. And, um, so I take a, I like to take a walk. I was not doing it for a little while because if you haven't noticed on my social medias, I'm doing many things right now. It feels so good. Like I think I, I recently mentioned that it was hard for me to work like as much as I wanted for a little while. Candace and I were finding our work from home stepmom balance. 
now that has been sort of achieved to where like I have many hours a day to work. And so then I forget like not to work all the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So I like realized because I wear one of, of the step monitor tracker things to keep my, my inner Tamagotchi alive. I like noticed that I have been getting just like such few steps, such few anything for like a week, uh, while I've been doing the bralette and getting ready for a new test and everything. Uh, yeah. so yeah, afternoon constitutionals, y'all. It's really, uh, miraculous, like how I feel so much more human when I just like allow myself to have siesta time in a couple of hours of a break, you know? Yeah. 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 Well, and this is going to air on the third, which will be. Oh, yeah. That will be day. the day before both you and I have a bunch of launches, which is why if we seem tired, <laughs> <laughs> that's why we're tired. <laughs> yeah. This is kind of my last big hurrah for the season. And then things are going to be pretty quiet for me, I think, until August. Uh, that is not true for me right now. But I am not sure. I'm thinking about doing my move and pushing some things around in order to make my life a little easier. But I haven't decided to do that yet. So we'll see what happens. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, from the designer's like desk, there's a push-pull between wanting to give each thing you do enough space while also mm -hmm. keeping some momentum and, you know, continuing to serve your audience. And it's hard to know exactly where that line is. Yeah. And when I kind of keep things in my pocket, um, well, the Therese dress, I still felt like I was able to give love to a lot of my testers. I still feel like because of everything happening with the bralette, I wish I had had a little more time to like, you know, I'll have to go back to, to restress testers that I want to highlight soon. Um, because yeah, exactly what you're saying. It's hard to give the appropriate appreciation to everyone who helps with the pattern. It's hard to give the pattern. It's appropriate like time. So we put so much work into things, but then having the experience of like keeping something for a long time, also felt like it was hard to give the pattern its due when it was like on the back burner yeah. for so long, you know? So I think this is like, this is a really good tie in for what we're talking about today, right? Which is the things that we reach for again and again and wear again and again, because we all operate socially online, um, in person too. But I think like we're really kind of focused on online um, when we talk about the knitting community, because that's where so many of us connect. You and I have never mm -hmm. met in person. Um, I know. So many of my relationships uh, in the knitting community are online only or online uh, mostly. And um, there's a lot of pressure to always be finishing a new project as a knitter, even mm -hmm. if you're not a designer. Um, and I think that, I don't know about for you, but for me, the experience of going through my collection and seeing what do I really reach for to actually wear was kind of interesting and enlightening. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I feel like I had to edit because there are some things that I do wear a lot that are not on this list, but I didn't want to have a list of like 15 knits because that doesn't seem realistic. Yeah. Yeah. So these are like, I kind of broke mine down into categories so that we could talk about Sorry. different, yeah, like different types of things that I wear a lot of. And um, I'm excited to get to it. Should we get Let's to it? Let's roll the thing. Roll it. You're the one who knows how long it takes. <laughs> That's how long it takes. <laughs> okay. Good to know. Um, okay. So before we get into it, I have a question for you. Um, mm -hmm. 
Are there any, can you tell me about a garment that you knit for yourself that you were sure you were going to wear a lot that you do not? Yes. Let me think about that. Jen likes to surprise me with questions. Y'all. Too. <laughs> so it's not like I didn't do my homework. Let me think. Um, okay. I'm going to say one of my own designs, which is not obviously any shade on myself, but the Catherine cardigan, because I finished it. Uh, it is a bulky weight cardigan with a lot of ease and it has sort of like a vintage country vibe that is infused with like a really beautiful Japanese lace. Um, and I designed it really specifically for my lifestyle teaching yoga in New York city. And immediately upon finishing it, I left New York city and then knit another sample while staying in the suburbs with family for a few months and then promptly moved to Florida. So neither of them get very much wear, but I still like, I haven't gotten rid of them because, uh, I would, I will wear them, I think, but they're not even winter in Florida. I don't know if bulky weight is the right weight for me anymore. So my knitting lifestyle, my lifestyle lifestyle has changed right because i'm in a warm weather climate what about you i feel like there's such a like a dear diary comment there on going from being a new york city yoga teacher to a florida stepmom um in less than the time it takes to get photos done for a finished (laughs) garment but that's what you did right and you're still like you're both of those people so of Mm -hmm. course you're gonna hold on to the knit that belongs to that side of you it's true And I think I still, I still like dress very much the same way that I did when I lived in Brooklyn, um, with the same rare, like rare opportunity for glamour and mostly just like lots of comfy clothes and sweatpants. So in some ways I still feel the same, but yeah, it's y'all changes. (laughs) (laughs) I I, so I all of my knits before I started designing for myself I thought I would wear and didn't every one of them because none of them were good (laughs) for me right like one of them I had a gauge issue one of them like I should have been in a different size and also the shoulders were weird on it like I just Mm -hmm. didn't know as much about choosing patterns for myself I didn't know anything about um I wasn't ready to take on modifications and I didn't have a good sense of my own dimensions because I wasn't in a place where I was ready to do that. Um, right. So yeah, I knit myself, I think two sweaters before I started three technically, but one was, I'll show you, I'll show it to you later, but two, I did two adult patterns. Oh, three adult patterns for myself in the past. And um, no, none of them. Yeah, I will say, I was going to note, all of the things that are in my list, I have knit since I became a designer. Um, And I also just want to acknowledge that now my grumpy old lady dog is next to me and she's making, if you guys hear groaning noises, that is not me. (laughs) That is my little piglet. But yeah, all of my most more knits are things that I've knit for myself since 2020. And one of them I knit like right before my first design. But I think since really putting so much effort into garment design, I have examined what wearable means to me on a lot of different levels. And so now even patterns that I pick out from other people are ones that I'll actually wear. Yeah. Yeah. So what kind of categories did you break your knits into? Well, I have several that are in the warm weather knit category because Florida. Um, Although I will also say that these are all, all three of them are knits that I knit while living in New York. And I wore them a ton there as well. I just think warm weather knitting is incredibly wearable um, for most folks. 
and in most climates, I should say. Uh, then I have two sweaters and one dress. Yeah. Cool. What Let's start with categories? warm weather knits because I, I didn't do categories. I was just like, what do I wear? Um, <laughs> no. Well, okay. Wait, before we get started, are you an overpacker or an underpacker when you go somewhere? Yes. <laughs> it's one or the other. <laughs> I'm either like, it's going in my backpack or it's not going. Um, or I'm like, how many check bags can I buy? Um, but I'm never in the middle. Never. Okay. I refuse to check a bag, but I still overpack and usually forget things that I need. But in terms of clothes, I'm always trying. When I went to visit my brother for the holidays, my stepbabies were like, we'll help you. And they were like sitting on my bag and like trying to That's zip terrible. it up. Oh my gosh. It was so cute. I was like, girl. I'm just going to need to eliminate one sweater and one pair of sweatpants. Like, this isn't working. That's funny. <laughs> but I try it. So it was the same for this assignment. I was like, this and this and this and this and this. Um, and then I was like, no. So I, I edited and then I categorized. And that's how I do things. Okay. So what do you have in warm weather? I want to I wanna talk about warm weather. Okay, so I'm going to start, I'm just going to put these in the order that I made them. How about that? Okay, yeah. This is a mesh tank that I made a super long, this is not my own design. Um, I believe that the name of this pattern is the Apex Tank. It's designed by Shibui Knits or released by Shibui Knits. Uh, from a Japanese designer whose name I don't know. And it was a very simple pattern for one of their, I'm sad that they have gone out of business um, because they, well, I'm not sure they're officially out of business or they're just not making yarn anymore or something, something, but there is no more yarn coming from them. They have offered so many beautiful warm weather yarns over the years that they've always been like one of my favorite um, sources. And yeah, I knit this because I wanted a summer, a summer tank that was simple. This is when I still like had a sexy dating life. So I used to just put that over a bra and go out for summer dates in New York. And I still wear it all the time down here in Florida um, over whatever. Um, it's knit with like a linen, cotton, silk blend. Mm. And this yarn is like just really wonderful. It's like a oh, thick yeah. and thin, you know, um, single ply, but like a single ply blended from those fibers. So it's not really a single ply, but there'll be like little thick cotton areas surrounded by silk. It's very luxe. And the yarn was in my stash for probably like... 10 years. I have no idea when I even bought it. Um, but this is what I ended up turning it into and I, um, love. So I do want to sort of design my own version of something like this because I wear it so often and I've thought of things that I might do differently, um, or sort of make it more my own, but it's just, like a mesh breathable silk blend is such a nice treat and it never gets stinky. And I just like leave it on my dresser all the time to air out, even though I wear it when it's like a hundred degrees. Yeah. So I teach a wardrobe class, right? And one of the things that I have found very helpful for helping people to make more knits that they will actually wear is to break things down to traits and properties. Um, mm -hmm. And so I heard you say comfortable, easy to mm -hmm. care for. Um, I'm noticing that it's very simple. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sort of neutral. Well, my personal wardrobe is pretty simple, which is probably because I have so many tattoos. I like it's to, noisy. Yeah. I like to have more like simple, solid t colors and neutrals, um, typically. And 
breathability is a big thing for me. I'm a sweaty person, y'all. And that's why I said, like, even when I lived in New York City, where it does get quite cold, um, most of my sweaters were too bulky to wear underneath, like, my winter coat uh, in New York. And if I, like, wanted to wear my fashionable looking coat. Um, and additionally, like, then as soon as you get on the subway, it's like blazing hot. So it wasn't comfortable and yeah. layers like this, like simple base layers and tanks and tees, even in the winter, I might layer them with warmer clothes, but definitely all in the spring, the summer, the fall, I could wear them with a jacket or not, you know? So, uh, I've always had a, a big soft spot. It's one of the reasons I knew I could move to a tropical climate as a knitter. <laughs> yeah. I just feel like we overestimate the amount of time that we spend in warm sweaters across the board. Mm -hmm. um, you know, they're most useful, I think, as cardigans that you can take on mm -hmm. and off easily. Um, because we don't spend a lot of time in our modern age in climates that are untemperature regulated. Right. Although, well, shout out to people who do. We have uh, received yeah. a comment recently from folks who are in like Iceland, the Arctic Scandinavia, Circle, yeah. and yeah, that, you know, I know if you're in an environment like that, then you are probably choosing high collared, thick wool sweaters, but the sort of silhouettes that we think of as being classical knits um, for most people, at least most of the people in the States, right? Uh, are not necessarily going to be that wearable because they are like really built to be furnace sweaters, you know? So yeah, yeah I'm a sweaty person. I, I can't do a furnace sweater very often. Mm hmm. So I, the thing that I have in my pile that is warm weather is my cotton classic LBD, right? Mm -hmm. Which is one of my releases tomorrow. Um, and the other one I already sent off. So I have this one here and it's, you've seen me wear it in other episodes, but um, this is the one I did surgery on. So some people have yeah. asked me if you can tell, and the answer is no, you cannot tell at all that I did surgery, but um, you inspired me to toss this one in the washer and dryer because I want something that I can use up. Um, mm -hmm. We talked about heirloom knitting last session. Um, but one trait that is I'm seeing throughout the things that I pulled is they're, they're things that I'm okay with unperfecting. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, I want to use them up. If they get stained, I still plan to wear them. I have built them with the intention in mind that I'm going to take them and use them. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So I finally have a knit cotton tee in my wardrobe and it is super soft. Um, this is yarn from Terrapin Fiberworks and it's organic cotton and it's super soft. It's a little lofty. Um, it's very drapey. It's very comfortable. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm wearing my organic cotton tee right now. And yeah. I do think they're super, super wearable. Uh, I have not put this one in the washer and dryer yet because sometimes I hold off until after their first photo session, uh, just in case anything happens so that I know I'm like, <laughs> because I'm such a, I'm such a worry wart. Um, but I have two cotton pieces here that are in my warm weather pile that both have been through the washer dryer like a bajillion times. And again, even the New York City laundromat washer dryer that are like, if you guys have never been to like one of the industrial laundromats like they have in New York and other big cities, um, those machines are terrifying they are like a nightmare space for your clothes that you just hope that what you put in them comes back out to you um it is very easy to like cook your clothes by accident and have them be like burn you when you try and unload it oh my goodness oh my God. <laughs> the things that can happen so there yeah i've had some knitting nightmares but these cotton pieces they did make it through this is a pima cotton um I don't even remember the brand, but it's not important. It's like one of those general sport weight Pima cottons that you'll see everywhere from some big brand. 
And I never wrote up the pattern for this, but I did design this tank. It's like entirely one by one ribbing. Um, I've always admired that pattern. I do really. I love like the it. neckline. I know it's nice, right? It's um, really nice. This is like one of the. Oh, I have it inside out too. If you guys saw ends, that's why. I saw um, ends. Here, this is the proper oh, there. way. <laughs> yes, she, she pretty now. That's the thing about one by one ribbing. It looks the same on, on both sides, but um, I this is one of the like early early designs that I really just improvised as I went, and that's why it never became a pattern because then I was way too intimidated to try and figure it out the other way around. And I likely have the skill now, so I will likely revisit this design in the future, but we'll see because it just didn't happen and I have other ideas. Um, but I do wear it a lot. It's like a little bit sportier on me than my usual silhouette because it's a razorback and I'm a little more of like a swoop neck girl, but it's so, again, really wearable. If I'm sweaty, if I'm running around at the park, like I can wear this all year round really in Florida. And I would wear this underneath my heavier sweaters when I lived in the North too, because it's just a cotton tank. I've been thinking so much about, you know, there's a lot of pressure on sustainability and like, as there should be, of course, like we want there to be a world for our children's children. Um, and things are as they are, uh, but also like to apply all of that pressure to making your own clothes and expect yourself again, to be like perfect and make perfect choices is unreasonable because it's not accessible. And when you compare, like I've now had this pink tank top for over three years, I've worn it, you know, dozens of times worn it and washed it. And it looks virtually the same as it did when it was brand new. Um, it has replaced probably five, 10 tank tops that I would have purchased from big stores like Target or wherever that are the places that I can typically afford to shop. Right. Like, mm -hmm. um, I wish that I could afford organic cotton for every piece of clothing that I buy, but when I know that most manufactured things are not going to be, um, they're not going to have the longevity of like something right. that I knit. So then I can't afford like a $70 tank top that will still only last one year. Um, but I can afford $70 of yarn for a really nice tee like this, that, you know, I'll be able to wear over and over and over again. And that is more sustainable than like, even if it were knit with acrylic, that is more sustainable than a polyester blend purchase that you're going to make, yeah. you know? It starts with using less rather than right. buying more fancy things. Right. Using what you have. And um, mm -hmm. so, you know, the I think of knitting sustainably as knitting things that I actually am going to use and wear and that fill gaps in my wardrobe. And that is when I like take the most pride and like really love something is when it is like making those regular appearances in my wardrobe and has actually filled the, a place that something I would have purchased would have been in, you know? Yeah. And you brought a number of cotton pieces to the table today. Um, I don't knit very often in cotton. Um, mm -hmm. But after knitting this tee, I'd like to do more of that. What tips do you have for knitters who are evaluating the patterns out there? And I feel like in previous seasons, we've seen a ton of wool tees, right? Or we've seen a, mm -hmm. like, we'll see the same, we'll see summer or spring silhouettes, but we'll see them in the same old fibers. So what tips do you have for choosing a pattern that maybe was written for a different fiber that you're going to use cotton for? So it's kind of like the inside out of yarn choice, right? Pattern choice. What are your tips there? Yeah. I think it's important to know that cotton, like, so one, not all cottons are going to behave exactly the same. Pima cotton is a lot heavier and, um, like 
I don't know if that is mercerized, but like treated shiny slick cottons it's are slicker. going to, yeah, they're going to act like tensile. Uh, not that I expect everyone knows what tensile is like, but like tensile bamboo Pima cottons are in the same category in my mind. They're heavy and slick and this tank, right? is one of those and that's why it has a, a racer back because of the amount of rib and stretch and movement that like if this were a tank that had a wider neckline it would fall off me all the time all the time so cotton is going to move around plant fibers are going to move around more than wool organic cottons like the tea i'm wearing the tea that you mentioned um this is alice and yours is the classic ldd uh those cottons that are loftier have more body and they are going to stay in place better but i still expect them to move more than a comparable wool um like in some of my content around alice i've mentioned that this is sort of like a sister design to my anna tee anna which i've worn on the pot a bunch of times it's my like baby pink scoop neck the scoop is um, not like a crazy amount wider. It will look significantly wider on a body, but probably only about an inch. So like a half inch on each side, but that difference of sitting like where my shoulder, like where my tra trapezius muscle is like meeting my shoulder bone and the slope is uh, a little more extreme there. You know, there's a little more movement from my arm bone there. A cotton tee that sits like out here, I would expect to fall off your shoulder a lot. So that's one of the main things is the neckline that like I thought about differently and that I would look for in um, like a wool tee versus a cotton tee. Like, do you think that neckline is going to um, sit well enough on your shoulders? If it's an ultra wide neckline and you're using a plant fiber, then I would expect that it might shift around on you, especially if there's a lot of ease, which is a, you know, that is a comfortable look. In fact, I have the, I have a tee here. This is the So Summer shirt from Jesse Maid. And this is like a really popular design. I knit it in an organic cotton. And it's obviously, it's a drop shoulder and it has a really wide neckline, but that's the look. It's like a lounge t-shirt. And just like a store-bought drop shoulder with a wide boat neck, it moves around on me a lot, but it has that casual, like effortless feel that yeah. I love, you know, with like sweatpants. Um, so I think if you understand that you can decide, you know, if you want something that's more tailored with a plant fiber, you're going to need to look for like a solid neckline. and. Um, I also include details like faux seaming and finished edges when I'm designing with the plant fiber, which help to keep the shape. If you are subbing a wool tee, subbing out a plant fiber, you have to be careful with checking your gauge and like the way you're going to wash and treat that plant fiber because you might, um, you might experience distortion of the shape that it just like cotton with a lot of ease tends to be very sack like. So, mm -hmm. um, I guess that's another big piece of advice is like, if you want a tailored look with a plant fiber, you really don't want more than like two inches of positive ease. Yeah. Otherwise you're going to have a very casual look which is great, you know, for your casual days, but know what you're doing when you make that choice, right? Yeah. Yeah. So looking for a neckline that is more structured and more close mm -hmm. and um, has more body to it. And then choosing mm -hmm. a design that's designed with um, less ease. So yeah. around two inches. I will say yeah. like that I knit my classic LBD in two samples. Um, and one is a blend and one is hundred percent cotton. And I wish I had gone down a size for the all cotton one because it doesn't mm. have the same shape. Um, and it doesn't have that same cling that will has. And so, yeah, I still love it, it but it's a little bit more casual, like maybe 6% more casual than <laughs> I might have chosen. Yeah. Otherwise. It's just but I love a little it with different. like linen pants. 
It doesn't exactly. have the clean, crisp look that the other one has, but with like linen pants or even over bike shorts or it's like a very like popsicles and sunny kind of vibe. Exactly. So like Alice is a little bit more tailored and I designed it for more like when I go to events at the kids' school, I want to look put together. Oh, I can't believe that I said that. Instead of like going out to a nice dinner. <laughs> One of those I, things. Yeah, you know, right. Both of those things for like when I want to feel more put together. Um, and that is also because I have all of these other knits that fill the space of when I'm really casual. Um, and then that would be yeah. like a different design for me. So, uh, yeah, this there, if you want structure from a plant fiber, you need a design that has a lot of structure. That's why this is yeah. a set in sleeve because I designed her really for like a hundred percent, uh, cotton and, um, yeah, some of some of my testers, even with Anna, that like used a silk or cotton instead of wool, they had all of those same things happen where it just wasn't like exactly the same look, you know? So I don't know if that is a helpful answer, but I think I encourage everyone to start experimenting and go for it. And yeah, if you're worried, then find a pattern that's made with cotton first yeah. and then like see how you live in it and how it behaves and then that'll inform you right yep yep um i like that you showed your off the shoulder piece um the blue one the so summer um mm -hmm. i have a piece here that is also like so i feel like as designers you and i are very interested in the pursuit of an ongoing improvement of fit of construction of um just a, like there's a precision we're trying to get yeah. closer to some objective uh, but also like it's okay to just like things <laughs> yeah <laughs> even if they're not perfect right and so honestly one of my most worn pieces is this guy um which yeah. i mean i started with a pattern from palas knits um but i didn't really follow it because i was using a different type of fiber and i was using a different gauge and i just winged it basically once i had my cast on um mm -hmm. it's the same front and back it doesn't have neckline shaping it chokes the bejeebers out of me um it's too short so like i wear it layered with a tank top underneath of it and um it's now like also because i've had it throughout many changes in my body like it's t too small i wear it all the time and part of that is because i don't care <laughs> right right and so yeah. it's fun and yeah like I didn't alternate skeins and you can tell. <laughs> yeah. But it's still cares? really fun and cute. And if I were not it's a knitter, fun and cute. if I were not a knitter and not a designer at that, then I don't know that I would like see you out in the world and be like, there's something a little off about the color of that sweater. You know, right. <laughs> um, it's certainly not the worst case of non alternating skeins that I've seen, but yeah, absolutely. Things. Well, so I have like my Therese dress I have here as one of my most worn pieces. And I'm not going to unfold her because I've worn her on the podcast. And you guys, if you want to know what she looks like, just go look on my socials. Um, however, this is 100% tensile. It's delicate. Like even I wear it often. Anytime that Candace brings me somewhere nice, I grab this and wear it. And it's my like fancy Florida date night dress. And I love having it for that purpose. Um, and I'm like so precious about it. Like I'm like thinking about what I order and worried about like what could happen. If you've been following me a long time, you know, I actually spilled. Well, I didn't spill a coffee, but coffee was spilled on this dress before I had ever worn it when it was being finished. And I've had to like treat it to high heaven to get the coffee out. White vinegar, by the way, white vinegar, always go to white vinegar first. First, if you stay, well, test it on a swatch. <laughs> Not if you have um, dye release. <laughs> Not if you're treating dye release. No, right. But coffee. Right. Yes. 
for coffee, uh, for food stains, food stains, white vinegar, especially on plant fibers. I don't know how white vinegar would react with wool, honestly. Um, I would be cautious, but I'm sure I've done it. <laughs> but uh, point being that like, it's okay to have your knits that are precious that are in like that pile of precious clothing. And that is a spot in your wardrobe, like when yeah. you want to feel precious. However, that's not how most of us are living our day to day lives. So things don't have to be like so perfect and so precious. It really is about just like what actually gets used. And sometimes the sweaters that you make that are like your first practice sweaters that don't fit you um, for whatever reason are still the ones that you're going to wear over and over again because they're warm, they're comfortable, they're soft, and you don't care what you look like walking the dog in the morning or wherever it is, you know? Yeah. Um, even when I lived in Brooklyn, I was still out on the street in like my pajamas and clothes that didn't match in the morning with my dog. I'm not, I've never been here to impress people on the street. <laughs> yeah, this is another thing we talk about in the wardrobe class is like you match the garment to your intended use. Right. Like mm -hmm. if I had made my malt shovel and sweater, which I did not bring, but I have a sweater that I made to do yard work in. Had I made that in tinsel, I'd be sad. <laughs> but I right. didn't. I made it in hardworking dark wool that will mm -hmm. hide imperfections. Right. And it's an it's an all over texture. It's Bach. But like um, like I made that sweater to be a rugged piece in my wardrobe, right? Like, so mm -hmm. that if I'm cooking and I get a grease stain on it, it's textured, you're not gonna see it, right? If I'm right. shoveling mulch and I rip it and I have to mend it, like, okay, it's gonna like that. It's just gonna have more character. So no, mm -hmm. having a plan in your wardrobe for how you'll wear your knit and then planning the fibers that you use, like don't buy that most expensive fiber for the thing mm -hmm. that you wanna wear camping. Right. And recognize that, you know, I mean, it, I don't know what your individual lifestyle is, person who's watching this podcast, but <laughs> I, like for me, I love luxury fibers and there are like quote unquote luxury fibers like organic cotton that are still going to be more usable in my life. There's only so many places in my wardrobe for a hundred percent silk for a hundred percent tensile, because that isn't what my day-to-day -day life is like, you know, I'm not the person dropping their kids off at school wearing like a silk dress, but I do see that person there. I don't know that she knits. <laughs> she might. <laughs> if that's you, then props to you. Props to you. Yeah. It could be Kirsten, right? It could be. I have no idea what Kirsten wears to drop her kids off. Although I have never seen Kirsten in some, in something that some of these ladies be wearing. Hi, Kirsten. <laughs> <laughs> so what else you got in your most wearable pile there? I have a shawl that I wear okay. all the time. Um, I talked to you about this in advance because I feel conflicted about this one. Um, mm. And here's why I, if you've followed me on the socials, you've seen me wear this a million times and I, oh, I usually don't tag, I usually don't tag this guy. Um, it's not my design. I, I wear it all the time because it goes with like all my favorite neutrals and I've evidently yeah. even all my not favorite or all my favorite not neutrals. Um, <laughs> it's, um, I do really like the stitch. I really like the way that the color blends with that. It's a mosaic stitch, and this is 100% Rambouille, which is like your girl's favorite. I um, do love that too. And I wear it's it like all the velvet. time. It's not very, it's not very big. Mm -hmm. um, well, it feels rustic, but it's not scratchy. Like it has texture, but the texture is not a scratchy texture. Mm -hmm. um, but it goes with all my fall and winter clothes. I wear it all the time. It's just a little thing. It's not overwhelming. The reason I'm always hesitant, though, to talk about it is because they're the charts in it don't work. Right. And I don't want to recommend that people go out and find something where the charts do not work. Um, so I will say the pattern is called the ocean. Um, the part that does not work is in the old shale lace pattern at the bottom. 
Um, so if you're comfortable winging it and you want something ultra wearable, you can go find it and wing it. But um, mm -hmm. just know that you're going to have to, you're going to have to budget. Okay. But so what particularly do you think makes this shawl one of the ones that you wear more than some of your other shawls? Is it the color or is it the overall? Because it is like a lovely neutral palette that is both interesting and also will blend into the background of whatever you put together. I think that even though it's highly patterned, the pattern itself feels neutral, right? Mm -hmm. So like from far out, it just looks like a soft gradient. Um, mm -hmm. So it's got a lot of depth. So it adds a lot of depth to a t-shirt, right? It's got parts come forward, come, parts come out. It's got both visual texture and tactile texture. Um, and I think that that really makes it elevate simple things. I also think it's the size. I um like to knit big shawls but they can feel really sloppy on because my mm -hmm. preferred way to wear a shawl is just loop loop um so yeah you're like, like a neckerchief shawls, neckerchief shawl wearer yeah I am. which yeah. i like i'm not a shawl wearer period but sometimes in my mind i think i'll become one but i just you know, everything has such a hard time staying on my body. I feel like I don't want something that's not attached to my body a little more. I feel like I would lose it. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know. There's just something about it. The colors are neutrals. You know, mm -hmm. we all know that clay and apricot and brick are neutrals. Um, it's comfortable. It's not itchy. It's light because it's a like it's a lofty yarn. So mm -hmm. it's just really easy to wear. It's easy to style with everything. It is a neutral in my wardrobe. Um, and it yeah. feels like a woven, it feels like a woven neckerchief that's like was so popular in like the late aughts and stuff. Um, that hipster neckerchief vibe. Yeah. And which I do I, wear sometimes. Yeah. I know. It's so your vibe. I love it though. That's a great, that's a smash. Bring that trend back for Although we'll get there because now what are we in? We're past the 90s. And we're in like the early 2000s or something. Yeah, I think we're up to 2004. Great. <laughs> Let's fast forward to like 2014 mm -hmm. and bring those neckerchiefs back around. Although 2004 is like the beginning of that trend. Anyway, uh, so point being that there's something visually that like calls to that like look that I think for people in our particular age group is like very cool you know yeah 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 do you have accessories in your stack no i don't need accessories <gasps> okay <laughs> you know it should be in my stack that isn't is my hat that i wear 175 oh, yeah. days of the year but it's not isn't that hat called could... florence mm -hmm. yeah i like it oh well that hat is matches my local meadow it does it's knit with the same, you designed this and did. your Florence hat works with the same stitch pattern too, right? And it's in this peach color. Oh, you have Logo Meadow too. I love Logo Meadow. I, I mean, this is one of my most worn sweaters for sure. And, um, you know, it's, I feel so a little nervous to talk about your design in front of you. <laughs> Okay. Do it anyway. As if, as if I, I don't do it. it all the time. Um, so here's the thing. My local meadow, because it's, it's big on me, it doesn't look very polished on me. Not because it's not a really well fitting sweater, but because like mine is big and it's a drop shoulder sweater. So it has a casual vibe to start with. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and this is like when I realized that I need to knit things for my upper bust size, not my full bust size and blah, blah, blah. So it is like my sweatpants sweater, but I wear it like most days in the winter in Florida. It's like my morning sweater. I don't bother to depill it most of the time. Maybe like once a year I'll depill it, but it gets really pilled because it's a very soft merino. Mm -hmm. um, and so that makes it like perfect for, you know, it's my sweatshirt sweater. It's a fingering weight. Also, you know, it's hard for me to knit anything that's not fingering weight. I just only yeah. want to work with fingering weight yarns basically because even in the winter and it gets to be, it's like 40 degrees here in the winter. It's cold. That's cold. Um, 
it is still not like worsted weight sweater cold most of the time and especially not inside no especially not inside like coming in and out of a space uh florida winter is like northeast fall right like i just wanted something i could wear in out wear all day um and that's this one so yeah yeah, i wear it over pajamas most of the time yeah, absolutely. Like if I was going to get dressed to go somewhere that I wanted to look put together, I would probably take it off. Although mostly just because of how pilled mine is. Because, but that's <laughs> the imperfection, right? Like mm-hmm. it's once you wear things enough, like they just can become part of your life in a way that they can't when they're brand new and perfect and unmarred. And yeah, mm-hmm. I mean, I wear, yeah, it's like if you're having a day where you need a cozy mug, having an oversized fingering weight sweater um yeah it's decadent it's lush yeah it feels so good i would rather spend twice as long knitting each one of my garments and actually wear them um there is a certainly a transformation for me as a knitter somewhere along the line and it probably is around the time that i started designing and really got very invested in what i was knitting that i realized like when I started knitting garments, it was about the satisfaction of like making the garment and taking the picture. But after you start stockpiling sweaters that you're not actually wearing, there is a switch, I think, where you're like, well, who cares how fast I finish it? How many times is it going to get worn for all of that time? It's not like it's yeah. fast to knit anything, even if it's bulky weight. It's never, it's fast for knitting. It's not fast. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then you make one thing that fits and you're like, oh, I could have had this all along. Yeah. It just feels much more worth the investment for me to, um, to knit things in a finer weight because then I know I'm actually going to reach for them and they're going to feel more like my clothes, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. My turn to talk about something of yours. Oh, Yes. She I noticed earlier, Carol? I was like, oh, she's wearing her bralette. I should have mentioned that. I am. I am. <laughs> I know we've spent a lot of time talking about Carol, so I don't want to um, overplay it, but I wear her all the time. I she looks put her great. On. Yeah. Yeah. She's um, looking good. I was good. not sure how I would feel about um, a wool bralette with nothing underneath it, but I think because it's snug, there's no way for like little fuzzy bits to get at me. And this mm-hmm. is... um a low micron count single ply. So it's very comfortable. I've worn it several days and it has held up. So yeah. Yeah. I find myself reaching for this more than I thought I would. I will say a little caveat for people knitting your own Carol. My single ply one that I've finished is lovely and is still doing great. But the multi ply, even though it was a silk blend, it did maintain its shape just like that much better. So if you are really, really, really worried about like having no change in shape, then single ply is still not going to be the way to go. But I right. think the average person is going to be happy with the single ply yarn for that pattern, like you are, because it's such a tight gauge. Like it's not going to change significantly. When I cast this on, I wanted, I was treating it a little bit like a double dare, right? Like, <laughs> much bolder than my normal palette of cottage core neutrals right Mm -hmm. um just like to have because you know uh, we uh, we talk so much about building a wardrobe that you wear a lot things that go together and yet we're in the stores and we fall in love with neons or we fall in love with like vibrant purples or deep saturated colors um and then we struggle to get them into our wardrobes and so you know we can do that through a couple ways right like one way is to have like separate things that you wear as outerwear that maybe don't have mm-hmm. to coordinate with your wardrobe or maybe you just have like a play look. Right. And so that's what I wanted to experiment with. And so I was like, I'm going to do this. It'll be fun for pictures. It'll be like an exploration and identity. It'll be fun. Um, I probably won't wear it that much, but like I probably worn it three times this week already. So um, surprise. I love to, I'd love to hear that. Uh, also like your underpants are a place to play. I'm wearing rainbow striped bra underneath my very boring 
T. Well, I don't think Alice is boring. I think she's amazing. But if you aren't a knitter, maybe you find this T boring. <laughs> she's but, not boring. She know, can I hear have... you. <laughs> <laughs> I love you, Alice. Um, so you, I talk about having like a particular aesthetic, but the truth is that my aesthetic isn't that interesting. If you're just looking at my clothes, like my particular clothing style aesthetic is pretty basic because I am not very basic. And there's something that feels, um, this is going to sound terrible. My initial instinct was to say that like toning myself down a little bit. Um, but it's more like choosing what I want to highlight and like allowing people to appreciate my tattoos or, um, the, the fact that something's a knit, right. And like sort of choosing one aspect of the things that I think make me interesting to people to highlight at a time. So if it's yeah. a bright color, then it's like a bright color, but I would not do like a bright color skimpy outfit that also shows all my tattoos because for me visually it becomes like too much to look at. So when I say like toning down, I more mean like if I am an art piece, it's stripping because back I, because I am right. Like what is the, what is the focal point of this art piece that is me today? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, what I did out loud, um, which is this micro collection, and I did the publication that's associated with it. One of the things I talk about is like, the, it's the principle of white space, whether or not that mm -hmm. space is actually white space or not. It's that principle. It's the equivalent of like, giving the eye somewhere that it can rest while we'll focus the focus attention visually on something else, or even like, you know, as a total picture, right? Because we're not just our visual appearance. We're also how we move, what we're doing, how we present ourselves. You know, if you mm -hmm. were going to give a talk on something complicated, you might not wear a complicated outfit because you might want to give people like give that part of their brain a chance to rest so that their ears could, um, could do more of that. So just bringing that mm -hmm. principle of white space into our wardrobes can give us the opportunity to turn up the volume in other places. Yes, exactly. And as, so I mentioned all the time that I'm a yoga teacher, my particular area of expertise, if folks don't know this is in relaxation. And so I've learned a lot about like your brain, the brain and, um, stress and like stress triggers, which of course are individual based on our experiences, but then there are also like universally calming or universally like stressing, um, stimuli. And so something that I've learned and something that I like always did as a teacher was that dressing more monochromatically dressing in simple solid colors is, um, more relaxing to people's brains. Like the, it's easier for someone to feel safe because they just want like a simple image to understand of you basically. So, um, that became part of my habit as a teacher was also to have like that soothing kind of palette of dressing. And so I think that is also like sort of, yeah. Yeah. What I mean. Part of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, um, we were talking about Carol and about your bralette, but I love seeing neons out there. And I loved like your use of neon. And then my Carol I'm wearing all the time because I've knit them in just like my everyday color palette as well of like soft pinks that I match all of my comfy pants and comfy clothes for mornings. Um, yeah. And wool is a surprisingly wonderful bra material. Yeah. It doesn't really speak to you. I'm very interested to see how cotton works out for that pattern, but I am too. Cause I have some cotton. Yeah, I have been, well, I'm addicted to buying yarn now for future Carol Bralettes. Every time that I go to a yarn shop, I'm buying like two skeins. I'm like, this what size because you only need two, right? So my size, I only need one small size privilege. Well, I would need uh, two colors. So I would need two at least no matter what. See, I'm really into not using two colors on mine now. My first one was mm. two colors. Candace's is two. The two colors looks wonderful. But there's something that feels 
in the salt again i like solid colors yeah <laughs> just really like i keep buying like oh this is a nice soft purple this is a pretty burgundy i've bought like a bunch of skeins that are kind of all the same but i feel like i actually need like seven ten of these and that i would wear them more i'm like disappointed now when i can't wear my carol because i have to wait until i do my sample photography and all of my store-bought bralettes give me like the four boots you know mm -hmm. so yeah yeah sometimes we're surprised at what's going to be wearable because i know yeah. that you i mean if you guys don't know this jen was a huge part of making that pattern happen uh, which i've said before and i'll say it again but even still, I think there was some part of, well, for both of us, even for me before I made mine, like, yes, one, the experiment, of, like, can we make a functional bralette? Two, the experiment then of like, well, what is it like to wear that, right? And so the curious part of my mind really, really wanted to do this because I love lingerie, I love underwear, I want um, to have this freedom to like make something. But, um, I think everyone who's, who's casting on and thank you y'all for being so into this pattern and the knit along and everything. Um, you can still join us if you want to buy the bralette tomorrow and cast on with us. But I think for everyone who hasn't knit a bralette yet, there is some element of like, well, am I actually, this is cool, but am I actually, this is cool, but it? yeah. Yeah. Right. Um, and even when we design something that's like technically sound, we still don't know until it's out there being worn, like how ultimately wearable it is. And part of that yeah. is based on your individual tastes and your lifestyle. And then part of it is based on like how well a thing functions as itself. Right. Yep. 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 I have one the more. hour mark, but show me what's in your pile. You got one more? I have one more. And Let's it's it. Ramboulet also. Yes. Yes. And oh, it's clearly. Clearly. It's, this is one of my own designs that you can. This is the only thing I. Well, besides Therese. <laughs> it's the only thing I grabbed that is one of my designs. Um, and I wasn't even going to grab clearly. But when I told my girlfriend we were doing this episode, she said, oh, well, you should clearly. And then I realized like, yeah, this is the sweater that I've designed. That it's the hoodie. Is, yeah. Yeah. It's my cropped hoodie. And it's the one that I do wear all the time, all winter. Again, it matches. I'm a high-waisted bottoms person. So if I am going out somewhere, it's with a high-waisted bottom. And then this cropped hoodie works well in those situations. Um, but also additionally works really great with like long layered tanks and sweatpants in the morning with coffee and my dog. And Rambouillet is such a good hard wearing wool. It's very velvety, but still rustic enough. It doesn't really pill. It doesn't felt too, like it's, I'm always impressed with how that wool is wearing. Um, I love that as, sweater. I'm a fan. I mean, I always just see things that I would do differently when I look at it. It, myself now because sure. it was like because i'm always learning and i live in constant fear that i'll look back at my work now in a year and be like <laughs> but then we look at the things that we pulled today and we remember <laughs> right yeah the, the pursuit of perfection is important but it's not important yeah i know this has been such a good exercise for me because i am quite a perfectionist at heart um, which like yeah. being a perfectionist y'all does not mean that things turn out any differently than if you weren't, it only means that you're hard on yourself and mean to yourself. So you might be a perfectionist and not even know it. And we should all continually, um, try to balance that, that pursuit. Yeah. I want yeah. to always grow and yeah, it was so nice to just realize that some of the things that are actually most used in my wardrobe are just simple, regular, imperfect things that close. Yeah. They're just clothes they're just that close. I like to wear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, my 
pelvic floor, my favorite outfit that my pelvic floor therapist wears is she has these like camo joggers that she pairs with this black quilted sweatshirt and it has big clearly energy like you could pair that because there's like an irony to it right it's like almost like you know you expect to see like a coach bracelet with this like quilted hoodie and it has that same silhouette like I, you could pair clearly with an ironic pair of joggers so fast oh absolutely i i mean clearly was definitely like a yoga teacher lifestyle design um mm -hmm. that still suits my non-public facing yoga teacher lifestyle and um yeah cropped hoodies little my sweaters i'm always just like designing them after sweatshirts because that Great. is like such a wearable silhouette you know yeah i have more things i'm doing for next spring that are designed specifically to wear with like workout pants like let's yeah. be real like once you put them on you don't take them off for the day so <laughs> i just change from one pair of workout pants to another you know like one pair of athleisure that i've gotten sweaty in into my athleisure that i hang out in <laughs> you're going out athleisure yeah yeah we're going the out workout pants store. exactly yeah. these are my tailored sweatpants these are the sweatpants with holes in them <laughs> yep my tailored sweatpants um sarah kareen is a tester and um a size inclusive activist um and i'm in some of her spaces and she tested lbd for me and she styled it with like sweatpant joggers i think like i can only see the top of it and i'm like this look right here knit mm -hmm. t-shirt french tucked into sweatpants joggers yeah yes that's <laughs> bring like, it that, on that's my summer look <laughs> yeah so i'll be sharing that one and thank you sarah <laughs> well, well should we talk about the future yes let's talk about the future we have 10 episodes and we're not slowing down we've got two episodes on deck yeah first one prepping for a photo shoot. Um, mm -hmm. We were thinking about doing like a paid workshop, but we're just gonna give it to y'all. Um, and we mm -hmm. will be well, talking- Well, I do a paid about... workshop. <laughs> yes, yes, you do a knit, a knit portraiture I do, workshop. Yeah, I do a different. knitting yeah. portraiture workshop. I have a lot of photography background um, and Jen and I have gone back and forth about how we were gonna like share our photo love and tips and advices with you. But yeah, it's it's this podcast episode that's coming to you. Yeah. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about like specifically planning for and executing a knitwear photo shoot. Um, whether you are a designer or maybe you're a dyer and you need to get some model shots of some of your yarns in action. Or even if you're a knitter who has a finished object that you would like to spoil. Um, so we will be doing that in a future podcast. And then... Mm -hmm. And then we are also getting ready for another uh, answering your questions episode. So y'all really loved it when we did that fit grab bag. And uh, we love talking about fit very much. It's basically what we were talking about today also, among other things. So let us know if you have specific questions about fit. And also this time, we want to talk a lot about yarn and yarn substitutions too. Um, that is an area where... I think people don't always realize how important your yarn choice is when you're new to making garments. And then you might have that realization that it's really important, but not know where to start. So yeah. give us your questions and we'll answer them as best we can. Um, or anything else you want to ask us and maybe you'll see it in our next grab bag episode. Uh, yeah. So that's two coming up Two. and anything else you guys want to ask us or comment on, you know, we are here for it. We appreciate your presence and uh, all the conversation and community that's forming around this little podcast. Thank you. Happy knitting y'all. <laughs>